Well, g'day and welcome to the channel. Today's video, I'm reviewing the Canon R6 Mark II. I've had it for about a week. I've been out in the field a number of times. I've used RF lenses, I've used EF lenses. I've photographed birds, I've photographed kangaroos, I've photographed all sorts of things. And I wanna share my findings with you. I asked my subscribers what questions they had about the R6 Mark II. Most common ones being, how's the rolling shutter? How's the noise performance? How does it compare to the R6, the R5, the R7? I'm gonna answer all those questions and more in today's review. The first part of the review, I'm actually gonna go out in the field and share with you my very first experience photographing ducks and different things. And the second part of the review will be where I actually answer those questions. So let's head out into the field and see what this camera's capable of. I'm at my local wetland. I'm gonna take some photos. I can't wait. Smile on my face tells you how excited I am. I can already see a couple of birds that I've never seen here before. Plumed whistling ducks, incredible. They're down on the point. I wanna photograph them. Um, I'm using my big 500 F4. I've got the 1.4 converter. We've got the adapter, so we've got 700 millimeters at 5.6. R6 Mark II, I'm cranking 40 frames per second. Electronic shutter, I've set it up like my R6 with back button autofocus, so we've got um, eye tracking. We've got spot, spot autofocus. I've got the ninja here to record what I'm seeing. I used my trusty ground pod you've seen in a few of my videos. And I just want to give a big shout out to Sue Ray, who kindly gave me the PH20 carbon fibre gimbal to use as my old gimbal came unusable due to years of abuse. I got down low, crawled towards the ducks, but I quickly realised these ducks were a little bit flighty, so I couldn't get too close. Now the sun hadn't even come up at this point, so the light was low and I decided to dial in a high ISO of 3200. This gave me sh a shutter speed of 1 200th, which is pretty slow. So the birds were probably 20 to 30 meters or up to 100 feet away from me. However, the autofocus found the subject. It didn't quite find the eye, but it definitely found the bird and we had tracking enabled. I took a burst of shots resulting in this image, which is okay given the conditions and I was happy I got this, but I would have liked to have been a little bit closer with better light. Thankfully, the sun did make an appearance, but the whistling ducks were long gone, but I did actually spot a Australasian grebe feeding nearby. I simply engaged eye tracking and as you can see, it stuck to the grebe like glue. I was seriously impressed with the speed and accuracy of the autofocus. It allowed me to follow the bird and take numerous shots as it swam by. I really liked the feel of this shot that I was able to obtain with the light bouncing off the vegetation. The next opportunity I spotted was a young welcome swallow resting on some reeds. I've had to handhold the 500, which is a bit of a mission, but the IBIS of the camera and the IS of the lens enabled me to steady myself. I positioned myself in the grass with a view of the bird and again engaged eye tracking, which immediately went straight to the bird. It's kind of like magic how well this works. And I took another set of bursts getting this lovely shot. Overall, I was just absolutely blown away with the autofocus. It was a big jump up from the R7 and I believe it's even better than the R5 and the R6. I spotted a little grass bird jumping through the reeds, which is actually a pretty difficult challenge for the autofocus and the tracking picked up the bird, went onto that eye, allowing me to get a quick burst of shots off before the bird disappeared into the reeds and I managed to get this shot. And this just shows the possibility of the autofocus. Now it's important that I mention that the autofocus is not perfect. It did let me down a few times. If the camera cannot see the subject, it's not going to be able to focus on it. I've tried to engage autofocus and it actually focuses on the grass in front of the bird. It can't see the black fronted dot draw anymore and I'm really, really struggling. Thankfully, we have spot AF, which is traditional autofocus like we get on a DSLR, focus on the bird. Once it could see it, engaged eye tracking again and away we went. So just be prepared that occasionally the eye tracking does get it wrong, but we do have traditional to get around that. Quickly switched from photo to video and I've managed to capture this beautiful footage of this black fronted dot draw. I really like this wide habitat scene with that beautiful reflection. So that was an incredible session. And the biggest testament to how much I enjoyed this camera was the smile on my face and the excitement I had after that session. I actually called my wife to let her know how I went. And she said, boy, you're excited, aren't you? And it's true, I was. I was just in, in euphoria. I was on an absolute high, which is a credit to this camera and showed how much I enjoyed using it. Alrighty, so let's start with the actual body itself. It's almost identical to the original R6. There are a few differences, uh, mainly on top of the camera. On the left-hand side here, we have a dedicated photo video switch, which is a welcome addition. We didn't have that on the R6 and it makes it easy to switch between photo and video. And on the right hand side above the control dial, we now have off, lock and on. There is slightly updated joystick. It has a bit more of a tactile feel to it. It's also got the updated hot shoe and that is about it to be honest. That's about the only difference you'll get between the R6 and the R6 Mark II. The last thing I wanna mention about the body and something that I've noticed is the lack of customizable buttons on the R6 Mark II. 
all we have is six buttons. And I know that sounds like a lot. Why would you need more than six? Well, this camera actually has quite a few new features like pre-burst, it has um, tracking from spot. It's got all these different features that I would like to access from a single button push. And unfortunately, I've almost pretty much run out at six. But believe it or not, the R7 actually has 11 customizable buttons because it's got a D-pad on the back and it's got a dedicated ISO button on the front that we can alter. So I would have preferred some more buttons, which is a slight weakness of this body. So let's talk about the sensor of the camera. It's a brand new 24 megapixel front side illuminated CMOS full frame sensor. It's a small improvement on the 20 megapixels from the R6. So unfortunately it's not a stacked BSI sensor from the R3. Canon for whatever reason are continuing to stick with the older front side illuminated technology for the time being. So the big question for me is, do these four megapixels actually make that big of a difference? So I've taken a comparison shot with the R6 of Gary the Galar, and when we zoom into 100%, you can see that, yep, those four megapixels definitely make the subject a little bit bigger. How much bigger? Well, we get around 10% extra linear resolution. So 10% is not a huge jump, and 24 megapixels is still on the bottom end of the full frame sensors. When we compare it to the R5, the R5 offers us at least a 35% increase over even the 24 megapixels. And when we zoom into 100%, you can see the R5, the subject is just way, way bigger. This allows us to crop a lot more and maintain a large file. So I'm not sure why Canon's persisting with the low megapixel bodies. I'm assuming it's to keep the 40 frames per second because we've only got SD cards. The lower the megapixels, the bigger the buffer, the higher our frame rate. So the other comparison worth doing is with the Canon R7 which is a 32.5 megapixel APS-C crop body. When we zoom into 100%, the R7 is just way, way bigger. That body offers us a lot more pixel density, and we can see on the chart here, the lower the pixel density number, the more pixels we have on the subject, the bigger the bird is gonna be. Now, if we were able to get close with the full frame, that's gonna have an advantage with dynamic range, noise, and all that sort of thing. However, if you crop heavily, that's when those APS-C sensors definitely give us an advantage. So it's 24 megapixels enough for wildlife. 100% it is. We've been shooting with less than that for a number of years. I've taken loads of photos and the photos I've already got from this camera are extremely impressive. At the end of the day, everything's a bit of a trade-off, isn't it? I bet you'd struggle to find another full-frame camera for around two and a half thousand US that offers 40 frames per second and the amazing auto tracking of this camera. If we look at the competitors, maybe the Sony a7 IV, that's got 33 megapixels, but 10 frames per second. And then I think the Nikon Z7 Mark II, that's got an incredible sensor, the 45, but again, I think that's limited to 10 frames per second, and it doesn't have as good of autofocus as this body. So you need to decide which one you prefer, high megapixels or lower megapixels and incredible autofocus in frames per second. For me personally, I would have preferred an updated 30 megapixel sensor from the EOS R and maybe gone down to say 30 frames per second. I believe that would have been a better trade-off than 24 and 40 frames per second, but that's just me. So another huge question I get is how's the low light performance? How's its ISO performance? What's the noise like? And if I'm being honest, most of these new full frame cameras are so good that you can shoot up to ISO 6400 without an issue. And with noise reduction software, we can shoot higher than that. So I don't think noise is as much of an issue as it used to be. And I don't think you'll ever need to worry about the noise with this camera. But I know we all wanna see a comparison with the R6. So what I did is I actually shot at 51,200, a very high ISO of Gary the Galar. The sun hadn't come up, so it was very early morning. And these are the results. When we zoom into 100%, yep, sure, there's plenty of noise, and the R6 does have a slight advantage, mainly because of that 20 megapixels. However, the R6 still competes very well at this point. And I actually believe when we look at it, the R6 Mark II has slightly better definition or contrast. It just looks like a better image to me. And when we compare it to the R5, it's obviously got a lot more megapixels. The subject's a lot bigger. And when we create the same framing, it's obviously pretty comparable. And here's another example shot at ISO 6400 where I actually made a bit of a mistake. I was actually shooting in the bush and then I've spotted some red rump parrots and a tree, but the sky was the background. I've lifted the camera up and I made a mistake. I should have reduced the ISO, but I've actually increased the shutter speed and I've taken a few shots and before I realized my error, the birds were gone. So I was stuck with this ISO 6400 shots of these parrots. And when we zoom in, there is quite a bit of noise in these birds, but as you know, we can just use noise reduction software I've used Topaz Denoise to remove it, edited the photo, and here's the final result, which I'm very happy with, shot at ISO 6400. I have no drama whatsoever with the noise performance of this camera. 
All right, so how's the dynamic range? Well, I haven't done proper tests, but I don't have any issues with these cameras whatsoever. I did test the ISO invariance of the sensor. What that means is if we heavily underexpose an image, does it have the same noise as a correctly exposed image? So what I did was set the shutter speed in the aperture and all I changed was the ISO. And when we increase the exposure in post, we see that the underexposed image has more noise than the correctly exposed image. All this means is that we should be trying to get the exposure right in camera, and if we heavily underexpose in the field, we're actually gonna have more noise than we would have getting it right in the first place. All right, so let's talk about the image quality. That's the fun part. That's what a lot of you are interested. And again, a lot of it depends on the lens you're using, the light, and how close we are to the subject. But boy, have I been blown away with the quality I've been getting from this camera. Check out this first image of a beautiful common brown butterfly on this beautiful tea tree. The detail is absolutely amazing. And believe it or not, this was shot on the RF 100-400. The quality I get from that lens blows me away and it's a, and it's a lens nearly all of us should have in our backpack. So I also tried out the 100-500 with my friendly superb fairy wren and I had a really good session and nailed some really beautiful shots. This is a shot I want to share with you. The detail here is exceptional. The sharpness is fantastic. So I will share a number of photos from today's video. You can download the raw files and check them out for yourself. So I also had a quick session with the old 405.6. That's an old EF lens. And I did capture this shot of a sulfur crested cockatoo, just giving us a bit of a display with the crest up and the wings out. I did notice that we don't get the full 12 frames per second on that old lens. It definitely slows down like the other R6. And I don't think it gets the full 40 frames per second either, maybe 20 frames in electronic. So I discovered something really exciting and really, really interesting. I actually had a session with the RF 800 f11 lens. It's a fairly unique lens, it's pretty slow at f11, and I haven't really been using that lens all that much, because when we use it on the R6 or the R5, we have a very restricted AF window. I think it's like 40 by 60%. You basically only get the center part of the viewfinder, and it makes it very difficult for bird and flight and a lot of other subjects. However, I thought I'd give it a go on this camera, and to my surprise, I couldn't believe it, there's a much, much bigger AF window. AF coverage now is at least 80%. Clearly the updated autofocus of the R6 Mark II allows us to use that lens with more autofocus points, which is fantastic. And I had a wonderful session and took some beautiful photos with that lens. Now I was shooting in a forest and I quickly found some dusky wood swallows feeding in the trees. I was stoked to capture this inquisitive pose at ISO 3200. And as you can see, the AF worked well to track the subject and the details are fantastic. I then heard the call of a yellow tufted honey eater, which was feeding in some everlasting daisies. And again, with the incredible eye tracking, it's locked onto the head of the bird, and I captured this shot handheld at 1 1 60th of a second. To say I was impressed with the performance of this combo was an absolute understatement. It was just so much fun. And my final image I want to share actually made me laugh. I was walking past an old orchard, and I heard some white-browed babblers, and there was a dead orange tree that they like to frequent. Bird jumped up onto an old dead orange tree and I made a bit of a squeaking sound to capture its attention and it's actually looked through its legs at me and I captured this shot which I was very happy with and uh, overall a wonderful session. So I don't think you're going to have any issues with image quality with this camera. Now, the other feature this camera has is the pre-burst feature. What that means is it allows you to capture up to 0.5 of a second worth of images before you take a shot. So you're basically buffering 0.5 seconds worth of images. And this feature is really, really good for a bird landing on a perch or taking off a perch. It means you're going to capture that little bit of action before it takes off. And that's quite handy. So how do we actually set that up? So we need to go into the menu and enable raw burst feature. Many of you suggested in my last video that I put this onto a customizable button, and I've done that. So basically what I've done is I've assigned it to the front button. So I just hit the front button and it brings up raw burst mode. I go down and I enable that. And now we can see that we've got the buffer bar on the left-hand side, which indicates we're now in pre-burst. We also have to be in electronic shutter to get this to work. Now, if I half depress the shutter button, you can see now in white there, we're now pre-buffering. We've now got 0.5 seconds worth of images constantly overriding there. Now if I hold down the shutter button, you can see we're now engaged. It's going up in green, so we're taking shots. And when I take my finger off, it goes red. The issue now is that I cannot take another shot until that buffer has cleared. So I can't take any shots. And now it's cleared, and now I can start shooting again. And that's problematic, to say the least, for me. Because say the bird flies off, and then you want to take another shot, or you can't, you have to wait for this buffer to clear. The reason being is the camera actually collates all those images into one pre-burst file. It doesn't record individual raw files, which is a real pain. 
And the only way to extract those as raw files is either via the camera, or we've got to go into DPP and extract them either all at once or one by one. It's absolutely painful and it's a horrible implementation. If I want to go back to normal shooting, I need to now switch it off. But let's just say I am waiting for the bird. I start pre-buffering, so it's pre-buffering. I'm taking a burst of shots, taking a burst of shots. Okay, now I want to turn it off. Now I can't until this red bar comes down. The red bar is now down. Now I go back, disable, and then I'm back shooting normally. You know, I would prefer just a single button press to turn it off and on, because sometimes going into that menu, even though it's quicker, we might lose the subject. Great idea, and it is useful in certain circumstances. Am I going to use it? Probably not that often. It's going to be fairly specific when I use it, and hopefully in the further cameras or updates, they'll make those adjustments that I mentioned. Fingers crossed. Another feature Canon are promoting is the digital tally converter. It's got a two times and a four times. A few of you have asked me, what's, what is this all about? Well, I can tell you that it's pretty much a gimmick and I wouldn't waste my time using it. Basically, you've got to be in JPEG only. Now, once I go down to digital tally converter, I go two times or four times. And if we go four times, all it is is a zoomed image. And the easiest way is just to demonstrate. I'm going to go to 100 millimeters and I'm going to take a shot at four times zoom. So let's have a look. You can even see at this view that it's just awful. And I take a shot. Now, if I turn it off, now if we zoom to 400 millimeters and we take some shots here, is the four times zoom and next to it is at 400 millimeters there's just no comparison i'm never actually going to use that feature maybe you'll find a use for it but for me it's no good for wildlife so another big question i got is how is the rolling shutter why is that important well this camera shoots at 40 frames electronic it gives us pre-burst which is an electronic so it's important that we can shoot without too much worry about rolling shutter what's rolling shutter that's the speed at which the sensor reads the data when we're taking photos. A slow readout speed results in warp wings and warp photos, as you can see on the screen. So the lower the readout number, the less rolling shutter we're going to get. I did some very rudimentary tests of flickering lights and using my drone. So this number is a guide only. Remember the R6 was 19.7 milliseconds, the R5 is 15.5 milliseconds, and I believe this camera comes in at around 14 milliseconds. So it's definitely an improvement over the R6 six as very slight over the R5. How does that actually equate out in the field? Well, if we look at our drone shots, we've start with the R7 at 31 milliseconds, the R6 at 19, the R5 at 15.5, and then the R6 Mark II at 14. And you can see the R6 Mark II still has visible rolling shutter. However, those blades aren't quite as warped as the others, but it's marginal. What this tells me is that the majority of the time, you're not really going to have a rolling shutter issue. However, if you're doing hummingbirds or something with really fast action, you are still likely to get rolling shutter on this camera. You're going to have to use mechanical or electronic first curtain if you've got really fast action. We're not really going to eliminate rolling shutter until we get into the stack sensor technology. This camera doesn't have a stack sensor, so we're just going to have to put up with a little bit of rolling shutter at that really fast action. But for me personally, I shot electronic shutter the entire time I've been testing this camera. I did get a little bit of warping and wobbling, nowhere near as bad as the R7, and the shots were mostly usable, so it's a non-issue for me, and I'm very happy to report that I don't think you will have a big issue with rolling shutter with this camera. All right, so let's talk about the class leading frames per second. You get 40 frames per second in electronic, which just kind of blows away even the pro level bodies. It's better than the A1 from Sony, which I think is 30 frames per second. Only the Fuji X-H2S and the OM-1 in this price bracket offer that sort of frames per second. And I'm not aware of any other full frame cameras at two and a half thousand that give us 40 frames per second. So what does 40 frames per second sound like? Well, it's silent because it's electronic shutter, but thankfully we do have an audible shutter option on this camera. We didn't have that on the R6, so it's a welcome addition. I've actually made it really, really loud, and this is what a 40 frames per second sounds like. <laughs> it's absolutely incredible. You are gonna be able to capture so many frames, often too many frames, but you know, if you wanna capture that perfect frame, 40 frames per second allows us to do that. And you can see in this burst of flight shots with this white ibis, as we go through the shots, you can see that we're actually capturing numerous different wing positions, giving you the flexibility to choose the best pose. The obvious question at 40 frames per second is, how usable is it in the field? How many shots can we actually take before we hit the buffer? Now it's important to note that on Canon bodies, your ISO heavily impacts the size of your file. So the higher your ISO, the less shots you're able to take. In my testing, I've set it at ISO 800, which is more realistic, and I've shot a fairly busy scene. This all impacts our buffer. 
So like my previous video, I did some tests and I've got some charts to share with you, which hopefully you'll find useful. So at 40 frames per second in full raw, our buffer is 66 shots or 1.6 seconds. That's not very long at all. However, if we switch over to C raw, we can actually get two and a half seconds. And whilst these times do sound a little bit short and you're thinking, well, that's not very good, in the field, it's completely different. It's not that often that you just hold down the shutter and I shoot by feathering the shutter. So what do I mean by that? I'm shooting and I take shots, take shots, take shots. If you give gaps between your shots, you're giving a chance for that data to write to the memory card. And I actually shot in 40 frames per second the majority of the time and very rarely did I hit the buffer. So 40 frames per second does end up giving us way too many photos and we end up spending a lot of time culling. So do we have a slower option? Yes, we do. In electronic shutter, we can go down to 20 frames per second which is the same as the R6 and the R5, or we could go down to five frames per second. I'm not sure why they've gone all the way down to five because that's not very usable for wildlife at all. I would have much preferred maybe 10 or 15 as the low point there. So how does it compare to the R6? Is the buffer better than the R6? Unfortunately, it's not. I believe the internal memory is exactly the same as the R6. We've got the same SD cards. Clearly at 24 megapixels, we're gonna have bigger files. So we're gonna, not gonna be able to take as many photos as we could on 20 megapixels. Now, if we look at the chart, it becomes pretty obvious. So at 20 frames per second, full raw, the R6 managed 94 shots compared to the 77 of the R6 Mark II. And of course, at 20 frames per second, I don't think you're gonna have many issues. You could even go to C raw for even more photos. So if 20 frames per second is too fast, we do have 12 frames per second in electronic first curtain and mechanical shutter. How does that shutter actually sound? To me, it sounds beautiful. It's actually quite quiet compared to the R7. It's about 10 decibels quieter than the R7 and it's one of the best sounding shutters that I've heard on any Canon body. And the beauty of shooting in 12 frames per second is the buffer is pretty much unlimited. You're not gonna hit the buffer when you're shooting at 12 frames per second. So ultimately the R6 Mark II, the R7, these cameras are always bottlenecked by the SD cards. The max write speed of an SD card is 299 megabytes. The max write speed of the R5, which uses a CF Express B card, 1500 megabytes, it's five times as fast. So it can obviously clear that data way, way quicker. And until we get CF Express cards on these mid-level bodies, we're always gonna be restricted to that SD card. All right, let's talk about the autofocus. And with a smile on my face, I can say, this is the best performing camera I have ever owned. The autofocus is exceptional. Now Canon have come out saying that they've proved the AI recognition of this camera, the tracking, the stickiness has improved, and I noticed it straight away. It is far better than the R7. It just sticks to the subject. The, uh, this does actually have some improvements over the R6. We've got a new auto detect feature, so we don't have to select animals. We can just put it on auto, and it's gonna choose whatever the subject is that it can see. And we also have tracking from spot autofocus, which is different from the R6. So how does that autofocus work in the field? Well, with bird and flight, if we can see the subject, I just hit the AF on button, the auto tracking finds the bird like you can see on this Ibis, and with the soft crested cockatoo, again, just whacked it on and it's just tracked the bird. Okay, so whilst that made bird and flight look easy, it's nowhere near that easy in the field. The camera will struggle if it can't see the subject, and that's our biggest issue. What we need to do is try to guess the focal plane. So focus on the ground where you think the bird in the sky is gonna be, and then you lift up the camera. What would be ideal is if Canon gave us the option, like on some other brands, to have a set focus distance on a button. So it's having a near and far focus distance. So when we're focusing, we can't find the subject. We just hit a button, which takes us to that distance, and it'll make it easier to find the bird. But we don't have that yet, and I hope they do bring it in the future. So how does the auto tracking work on non-birds? Well, I used it on the yellow-footed antichinus, and we can see that the tracking has gone straight to the eye. It's stuck on the eye of that little <laughs> critter, and we've managed to take some shots handheld at really low shutter speeds and got super sharp shots. As I showed at the start of this video with the black-fronted dot the eye tracking can get confused and with these kangaroos and long grass the eye tracking was struggling to pick up the kangaroo so I've then used the spot autofocus to guide the uh, autofocus onto the kangaroo it's managed to get it even in that grass and give us some sharp shots so with the eye tracking and the spot autofocus I can pretty much handle any autofocus situation that comes to me. and through my use of this camera I'm actually blown away with how good autofocus is today considering what we've come from 
And if you get the R6 Mark II, you will be just as impressed as I am with the autofocus. So another massive improvement of the R6 Mark II is its battery life. I don't know what Canon have done, but they've made it a lot more efficient. I think it's almost 50% more efficient than the R6. And I saw this in the field. I had a four hour session taking loads and loads of photos. I think I took over two and a half thousand photos. When I checked the battery, it still had 21% left after four hours of shooting, which is pretty incredible. So if you had a battery grip, which this camera does take, thankfully, you could put two batteries in there and you could shoot all day without an issue whatsoever. So I don't think we need to worry about battery life any longer on these mirrorless bodies. Now, I haven't spoken very much about the video features of this camera, but there are some significant improvements. The main reason why I bought this camera is I currently use the R6 to film myself, but in this hot Australian summers, the R6 has a tendency to overheat when shooting in 4K. So it makes it very difficult to use. This camera does not overheat in 4K 30. It can go up to six hours without overheating, which is awesome. So what's great about this camera is that there is no crop while you're in 4K. It gives us C-Log, three with 10-bit 422 files. Unfortunately, it doesn't have 4K 120, which is our slow motion, but we do get 180 slow motion in the lower 1080p mode. Uh, it also gives us false color. I'm not that familiar with that. It's got a feature now that it won't go to the background. So if it's on a person like me filming, it's not gonna go to the background, which is really, really cool and nice to have. And we've thankfully got rid of that 30 minute time limit that Canon have had on our cameras. So we can shoot for longer than 30 minutes without the camera turning off. So overall, I'm very happy with the uh, video capabilities of this camera, and I'm gonna be using it as my film camera. And I shot plenty of film out in the field over the last few days. And as you can see, it actually came up really, really nice. So when I judge a camera, there's a few things that I think are really, really important. Those being the autofocus, the frames per second, the noise performance, the buffer, and if there's any rolling shutter, and of course the IQ. So how does the R6 perform in all of those factors? Well first, the AF, as I mentioned, it's superb, it's possibly the best of any camera out there for wildlife. Massive tick there. Uh, the frames per second, again, class leading, 40 frames per second, you're never gonna miss the action, it's awesome. So in regards to the ISO performance, it's really, really good. We can shoot at ISO 6400 confidently, we can shoot higher with noise reduction software. I would have liked a backside illuminated sensor for even better noise performance. Now the buffer, it's pretty good and I don't really hit it that often. It could definitely be better with a faster memory card, but I don't think the buffer is gonna be your issue with this camera. And the rolling shutter, as I've mentioned, 14 milliseconds makes it one of the fastest front side illuminated sensors out there. It's definitely no stack sensor, but we're gonna be able to shoot confidently in electronic shutter, all for except that fastest of action, which means I'm happy to use that with this camera. And finally, the IQ, as I've shown with all the photos I've shared today on these nice lenses, even the cheaper RF 100 to 400, the IQ is excellent. You're not gonna have any issue whatsoever in that regard. Of course, I would have preferred more than 24 megapixels. That's always a little bit of a hurdle. I would have liked more, but 24 still offers plenty if you can get close enough to that subject. So my overall impression of the camera is very good. And in terms of just having fun, I actually prefer to use this over my R5. This is by far the most usable and best camera I have used to date, and I absolutely love it. Will I be switching to the R6 Mark II? Well, no, I won't. Why is that? Well, the R5's 45 megapixels are just too hard to ignore. Once you get that many megapixels, it's very hard to go back. The ability to crop afterwards and maintain that detail is just too hard to ignore. Yes, this has better autofocus. Yes, this has better frames per second. But at the end of the day, I'm probably just gonna err for those high megapixels. Um, it's just the way it is. However, if you can't afford one of those high megapixel bodies, then yes, at two and a half thousand, this is possibly one of the best performing cameras that you can get. So would I recommend existing R6 owners jump up to this camera? I don't think you're gonna see a massive difference in the IQ. The biggest difference is those extra 20 frames per second, if that's what you're after, and obviously the autofocus. The autofocus is excellent. It's not to say the R6 is bad. The R6 is still exceptionally good. This is just a little bit better. If you wanna have a little bit less rolling shutter and have the better video features, then perhaps it's worth an upgrade. But again, I can't answer that. It's entirely up to you whether you value those features enough to then make an upgrade. Now, what about the R7 and the R6 Mark II? That's a difficult one to answer. This is the better camera by far. The autofocus, the keeper rate, all those things are way better. However, the R7 has that massive advantage of the reach. The subject's just gonna be way, way bigger. 
And for some people, they much prefer the reach over these other features. So if you can't get close to the subject, you've got short focal length, maybe that R7 sensor just gives you that advantage that this one doesn't. But in terms of usability, this camera is far superior. Something worth mentioning though was how well that RF800 F11 worked on this camera. That improved autofocus now means that that lens is usable and 800 millimeters is a great focal length if you're struggling to get close. So we'll do a video on that in the future and it's worth considering with this body. So if you've been on the fence about switching to mirrorless, this might be the time to switch. They've learnt from their previous models. This Mark II is superior in almost every way, and I believe this is probably the perfect camera to start with on a mirrorless body. So if you enjoyed this video, obviously give it that thumbs up, leave a comment below. What was your favorite photo from today? Are you buying the R6 Mark II? Do you have it? Let us know how you're finding it. If you want to support me further, help me purchase gear like I have with this R6, you can become a paying member. It costs less than a price of a coffee per month. You get a cool little bird next to your name. You can obviously make that one-off super thanks donation if you like. But until the next video, happy birding, take care, and we'll see you in the next one. See you later. So the R6 Mark II gets tracking from spot autofocus. Why would we need that? Well, sometimes the eye tracking gets confused. It goes to a branch or whatever, and we need to guide the autofocus. So we need to direct it in the right place to go. So we've got our focus point, our spot autofocus point. When we put that over the subject, the camera is gonna give focus to whatever's underneath that. And if it can detect a subject, it's gonna give us a little tracking box. And then if we hold down the star button for spot AF, it's just gonna start tracking underneath that autofocus point. So if we have a look at this owl here, we can see as I place the focus point on the owl, we get a little tracking box around the eye. If I push the star, we now get the blue box around it. If I move down to the uh, galah, we get that little white box and then we track it like so. So all it is is just guiding us to where we need to focus. And it works well the majority of the time, but sometimes we want to actually turn tracking off. How do we do it on the R6 Mark II? It's a little bit confusing and it took me a while to figure out. Basically we need to turn subject detection off. So currently I've got it set to auto, which is a new feature on this camera. So all we really need is to have auto and off. And then we just need to assign that to a button. So on the right hand side of this camera, I'm just going to assign a custom function to this button that simply turns subject detection on and off. And that way we get traditional spot autofocus without tracking. To do that, we actually need to go to the AF menu and we need to go to AF4. We need to go down to limit subject, subject to detect. And we need to deselect people, animals, vehicles, and just have none and auto. That means it will just cycle between those two. Now that we have the subjects limited to those two, we need to go to um, subject to detect and we can see now that we just have auto and none. So now I need to go into customize buttons, go into here, go down to the right hand side button, go into here and I need to select direct select of subject to detect. We select that and now if I want to turn it off, see how we've got that white little box, I just simply hit the right hand side button and it says it's set to none and now we've just got traditional spot autofocus and we can focus wherever we want. If we want to focus on the background, we can focus back here. If we want to turn on tracking, we get it back here. It's a little bit confusing, but it's the only way I could figure out how to turn the tracking on and off quickly um, on the one button.